It's a pleasure to have Larry Summers with us uh, this evening. Um, uh, and we're going to uh, talk this evening about the state of the world. We'll start by talking about the US and then Europe and then we'll China and then we'll think about what context that creates for, for the developing world and for the countries uh, that we uh, want to <coughs> see uh, join the, uh, the world of, of prosperity. So, um, uh, Larry, uh, you've been fairly optimistic and constructive about uh, the U.S. economy uh, since the crisis. And uh, uh, there's a sense in which the recovery has disappointed. And maybe uh, uh, this year has been uh, slower than, than, we, uh, than many expected it to be. Uh, in spite of what has been fairly supportive fiscal and monetary policies in, in the U.S. Uh, so um, how do you see the U.S. recovery? Uh, is, are better times uh, around the corner? How do you come to terms with uh, the disappointing slow recovery? I'll answer your question in a second, Ricardo, but let me say a couple other things first. Uh, uh, the first thing I want to do is thank David Elwood for that uh, generous introduction, and he's heard me do this before. Um, I once had occasion to introduce President Clinton, and I introduced President Clinton in very, very generous uh, terms, talking about his various financial accomplishments. And he came up, and he shook my hand, and he put that big arm of his around him, and he said, Larry, you have just demonstrated one of my first laws of political life. Whenever possible, be introduced by someone you appointed to high office. <laughs> <laughs> Appointing David Elwood was one of the better things that uh, I did uh, during my time as president. And one of the better things David has done during his nine years as dean was appointing Ricardo Hausman as the head of CID. Uh, Ricardo, there are people who are smart, and there are people who are bold, and there aren't so many who are both. And uh, you, are, uh, you are both, to be sure, occasionally boldly wrong. Um, but, always provocative and interesting, and it is a real pleasure to be your colleague, and it is a real pleasure to observe. I remember when David and I talked about um, your being appointed uh, to this uh, position, that I felt a very important virtue that you would have in this position was that you would involve the university in its development effort, not just with professors at other universities, but with a wide range of practitioners, with a wide range of people involved with very different experiences across the developing world, and the group that's been assembled here these last five years and is assembled here right now is a testament to that. I didn't anticipate that I'd have to have sessions where I would get interviewed by you, uh, which are a good deal more difficult than sessions where I'm interviewed by other people. Um, but uh, that is the price uh, that we pay. Look, are there, two, there are different ways of thinking about uh, the U.S. recovery. I think the facts are pretty clear. The U.S. in the fall of 2008 and the early winter of 2009 was experiencing what the United States experienced in the fall of 1929 and the winter of 1930. What has played out is profoundly different than what played out at that time. The economy has been growing for three years now. The depression possibility was clearly removed. Having prevented the economy from falling off a cliff, it's not surprising that the upslope has been less steep than it was at the times when the economy did fall off a cliff. So the criticism that says the recovery has been less rapid than other recoveries, well, sure, the damage has been less, was less severe uh, than after other financial uh, crises. On the other hand, it is certainly right to say 
that the economy has not seen accelerating growth, although it has seen consistent growth, and the economy has not seen um, growth at a rate that has cut rapidly into joblessness or cut rapidly into the shortfall of the economy relative to its potential. Now, any time something is imperfect, there is always a debate. And there are always two views. There are always people who say that basically the right strategy was pursued, and it just needed to be pursued more intensely, and it needs to be pursued more intensely in the future. And then there are other people who say that you need to change course and move to an entirely different strategy. I think the evidence is overwhelming that the problem is that there wasn't enough done to get the economy moving. You look at parts of the country where there was more infrastructure spending and parts of the country where there was less. The parts of the country where there was more infrastructure spending have done better. You look at sectors of employment where there was more spending and sectors where there was less. Employment has been better in the sectors where there was more. You look at periods after the monetary policy has been easier and periods after monetary policy has been tighter, growth was more rapid after the easier monetary policies. You look at the natural experiment provided by the fact that there are 22 countries in the G20 and look at the ones that had more expansionary policy and had less expansionary policy, the ones that had more expansionary policy had more rapid growth. So I think it's pretty clear what's basically going on here. What's basically going on is that the reason we have a recession is that instead of the private sector all wanting to spend more than they save, which is usually the case, they have experienced such a shock from the bursting of bubbles that they all want to save and nobody wants to spend. There's a natural market mechanism for fixing that, which is for the interest rate to come down but the interest rate can't come down below zero. And so you're left with a big upsurge in the desire to save relative to the desire to spend. And that's what you have to correct to get the economy going. And the tools the government has for doing that are to uh, spend more or return more money to people, basically fiscal policy, or to create an expectation that things will be more expensive to tomorrow than they are today so as to pull spending forward, adjusting interest rates. That's basically monetary policy. And that's been done to some extent. If it had been done to a greater extent, we probably have had a uh, more rapid recovery. The great risk in the current moment is that we will have some kind of misguided lurch to austerity associated with the so-called fiscal cliff. And I think that will be avoided but there's no certainty uh, that it will be avoided. So I think you have to give the US economy a grade of uh, in recovery, a grade of incomplete at uh, this point. The direction is right. The magnitude is, uh, insu is insufficient. And the challenge of policy is to find ways of doing more uh, to promote momentum. Some of that goes to things the public sector can do. Some of that goes to instilling private sector uh, confidence, reducing uncertainties that influence the private sector so that you generate uh, more demand. But what's crucial, I think, is that you recognize, and this is a very hard thing for people to recognize, that the central irony of financial crisis is that it is caused by too much confidence, too much borrowing, and too much lending. And it is only solved through more confidence, more borrowing, and more lending. And that is a very difficult thing to appreciate, but it is the reality. So um, uh, how should we think about, say, beyond the very short run in the fiscal cliff, growth in the US in the next two, three years? Look, I think what we have to hope is that the engine starts to turn over, that uh, as housing wealth starts to increase, um, as uh, replacement cycles kick in for durable goods, as, car, as the fleet of cars uh, gets older, 
as information technology moves along and it becomes more and more important to have the latest, uh, pro latest uh, product as government hopefully makes uh, a greater commitment to taking advantage of this moment to renew our infrastructure, that you will get an increase in demand that I think we now understand that at moments like this, the multiplier is much greater than it normally is, so increases in demand have greater benefits because they don't get crowded out through higher interest rates in the way they uh, normally do. And I think there's the prospect of increasing growth to the 35 to 4% range. I don't think that's a certainty. I don't think that's something we can rely on. I don't think that's a prudent basis for making a budget forecast, for example. But I think it is a reasonable thing uh, to uh, play for. Now, across the Atlantic, we see uh, a, s a tougher situation in, in Europe. Uh, we see uh, governments that initially tried to stimulate their economy through fiscal policy they have been clobbered by financial markets, say in Spain or in, 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 in Italy or in Portugal, that they've had to tighten up uh, conditions. But we've also seen uh, a different approach to macro policy in the UK uh, that has its own currency and, and, and could use and did use uh, more, more uh, accommodative, uh, supportive monetary policies. Uh, and there also we see this has been a particularly bad year. It has not been sort of like the continued recovery year, but a, a return of uh, recessionary pressures in several countries. How do you see Europe? Is, this, uh, is, this, uh, is there a shoe yet to fall in the global economy from a crisis in Europe? Or, or is this just a, sort of like a bad year followed by a better one? Well, I think you want to distinguish the British case from uh, the uh, continent, from the case on the continent. So let's talk about the British case for a moment first. Uh, Britain, if you wanted to do an experiment in economic science, Britain versus the United States is a pretty good experiment in economic science. In America, we came in and we basically said Keynes had written a good book. We basically <laughs> said that yeah. demand was important. We basically took an analytical perspective and proposed a combination of spending increases, uh, temporary spending increases and tax cuts to increase demand and move the economy. In, uh, and we explained all the Keynesian ideas that if each individual saves more, since one person's spending is another person's income, if each individual saves more, the result will be that there'll be less total income and therefore they'll end up being less total saving. That was what we did in the United States. In Britain, they forgot that Keynes was British, and they basically went back to what was the pre-Keynesian treasury view, which moralized about all this, and basically said that people shouldn't spend more than their means, government shouldn't spend more than their means. If things are bad, that's a reason to tighten your belts. And they basically called on everybody to tighten their belts, and everybody did tighten their belts, and the result was that one person's spending was another person's income, and so since everybody's spending went down, income went down as well, and the economy has experienced a profound contraction. They explained what they were doing by saying that, you know, we are focused on the long run. We're not going to just give rise to short-term palliatives of spending. Only one problem. If you look at what the consequence is, what's quite remarkable is the way in which the British uh, Budget Agency has not just steadily revised down its forecasts of the British economy in the near term, but they have radically revised downwards their view of Britain's long-run potential. The so-called potential GDP in Britain has been cut by 4 or 5% over the last several years, and the reason is because there's less capital investment, because people who are out of work for two years you know, don't usually go back to work, because people go on uh, disability of various kinds, and they don't come back. So I would argue that Britain versus the United States is, a, is about as good a natural experiment as we get in, the United, in economics, and that the natural experiment speaks overwhelmingly to the efficacy of the strategies that have been pursued in the United States, 
and to the inefficacy of the strategies that, of the strategies that were proposed by those who think, uh, the sort of neo-Austrians who think that, you know, you had a bubble, so now you need to have a retrenchment, and that'll somehow make it better. So I think in Britain, clear lesson, um, pretty clear what's happening. I think the continent is much more complicated and is in some ways a tragic story. You know, imagine a family unified after a long history of tensions that seeks to build a large, expensive dream house and really doesn't do a good job of building the house. The foundation isn't quite uh, deep, uh, deep enough. The construction is flawed in important respects. And the house is rickety and poorly insulated and causes pain to uh, the occupants. But it's the new family manse. It's inconceivable that you tear it down. And once you've built the house, while everybody's living in it, it's not so easy to fix the house, but you have to try. And so things are kind of difficult and depressing. That's the way to understand what's happening in, you know, you can discuss, you can, you can go further with this, you know, um, Germany lives in dad's room, and <laughs> France lives in mom's room, and <laughs> there, it's a blended family, so it's all pretty complicated. You know, the Greeks are upstairs somewhere uh, in one of the in one of the bedrooms, and people periodically turn off the heat to teach them all, uh, to, te uh, to teach the uh, to teach them a to teach them a lesson. But it's it's unthinkable to tear the house down. And so the house will probably continue to stand and people will do what's necessary to buttress the house. But it's really hard to get to a good place anytime very quickly after what's been, after what's been done. That's the way I think of Europe. I think the odds are not certainty, but my reading is that, in essence, a decision has been made in Germany and probably in some other places that um, keeping the family together is more important than any concept of Teutonic monetary virtue. So at the end of the day, any time it comes down to a choice between things that seem flaky to central bankers and putting at risk political union, they will choose to do things that seem flaky to central bankers. I think the problem is, the problems are really threefold. One problem is that sometimes people who want a lot of things miscalculate. Everybody would have preferred to concede whatever they were worried about in August of 1914 than to have fight, fought World War I. But they thought they could have peace and pride. And it turned out by the time they realized they were wrong, they had lost peace. And it could be that people will make mistakes and that by the time the bank runs start, it will be too, too late to put things back together. I don't think that will happen, but that is a risk. Second risk um, in the situation is that it will be like the gold standard in the 30s. Everybody was totally committed to the gold standard. They were totally committed to the gold standard. Just the economies just didn't work consistent with that straitjacket around them. If you look at every financial crisis since the Second World War, in, on every continent, you will find that financial crises that were resolved in part through governments borrowing less, in every case, the exchange rate declined sharply, the real exchange rate declined sharply, and the country in question became more competitive and exported more. And it is the quintessence of a common currency that that mechanism is removed. 
And so the question of how do you make there be, let's assume that the banks in Spain all function fine. How is the Spanish economy going to grow? That que at what are fundamentally non-competitive exchange rates. And maybe you can drive wages down 30%, but it'll be a pretty grim and unhappy and long process. And by the way, while it's happening, all the debt burdens relative to all the incomes will be going up, which might not be so good for promoting uh, spending. And so can you make that work? Maybe. But it's a really hard process, and you can't be certain that people will be willing to persevere with it forever. And then the third uh, question is, let's assume you get monetary union out of the headlines. Let's assume that the euro is well-functioning. We sort of learn something in a much less serious way from our own experience in the United States. Basically, by August of 2009, the risks of banks failing and stuff like that had been taken away. It was clear by August of 2009 that there weren't going to be major bank failures in the United States, that there wasn't going to be major systemic financial risk. But getting the finance system to be non-collapsing is not the same thing as getting the economy to grow. And so I think the longer-term risk is that Southern Europe will be to the rest of Europe as Southern Italy is to Northern Italy. Poorer, dependent, grumpy, kind of static, but life will go on. And I think that's sort of the third downside uh, in this situation. I think it's always a good idea in these things to you know, take a contrarian view and ask how you could be wrong. And I think it's certainly been impressive how much the markets have, the bond markets of various kinds have rallied. And I think the chance that they will paper over all the various financial difficulties are real. But I think the prospects that there will be a strong basis for growth in the larger part of the continent are not very good for quite some time to come. Well, that's sobering. <laughs> in in uh, 1994, I believe, you published a, a very influential paper with uh, our colleague, Lance Pritchett, whom you'll hear about tomorrow, and, and Bill Easterly and, and Michael Kramer, uh, that I think was called something like good policies or good luck. And what I remember from that, from that paper is that you showed that in the correlation between the decade-long rates of growth of a country uh, across subsequent decades. So if you grew a lot this decade, will you grow a lot next decade? The probability, the, the correlation between those rates of growth is essentially zero. Now, we have had three decades of amazingly fast Chinese growth. Uh, no country in the history of mankind has ever grown at those rates for so long. It is now a very important part of the growth engine for the global economy. Uh, it, it's driving commodity prices, it's driving investment in a lot of the developing world and so on uh, because of those uh, demands uh, that uh, growth in China are, are generating. Um, the economy in China has been slowing down to enviable rates, so everybody is concerned about they're growing at seven and a half, only at seven and a half percent. But, but uh, that, that is, uh, is still a historically unprecedented rate of growth. But the question is, um, is that a feature of the coming years, or are there risks to that, uh, to that trend? Is, is, is China going to behave according to your 1994 paper with no correlation with its... What, what do investment banks say? Past performance is no... Assurance for to future performance. <laughs> right. um, look, it's a um, well-known observation that when an athlete is, appears on the cover of Sports Illustrated, <laughs> they usually have a slump afterwards. <laughs> and when a politician appears on the cover of Time magazine, they um, usually have a reversal uh, in their uh, political career. 
And when much of anybody appears on the cover of Newsweek, Newsweek doesn't have that much more covers uh, <laughs> in, uh, the, uh, in the future. At least the first two of those observations are really reflecting the fact that things have a way of, uh, in the statistical term, regressing to the mean. And that usually when you've, an athlete appears in the Sports Illustrated, it's because they've been both skillful and had good luck. And at least the good luck usually reverses itself. And what this paper showed is that the same is true for countries, though it is badly not true for the perceptions of countries. So what's just unambiguously a fact, and by the way, this, this paper has um, passed what I think is the test that about 35% of empirical economics papers uh, pass, which is you discover some relationship that you think is surprising and you call attention to it. And then you wait 20 years and you see whether the relationship is in the data in the 20 years after you wrote it. Um, that's, that's the hard test of science. And sure enough, the 19, we wrote the paper in 1993 using data up to about 1990. And if you look at the correlation between the 1990s and the 1980s, which we didn't have, it's near zero. And if you look at the correlation between the 1990s and the decade of the noughts, which we didn't have, it is near zero. So this is, I think, a valid statistical uh, fact. And I don't think it informs anybody's intuition. Um, and everybody's intuition is to extrapolate from rapid growth. That's why um, the famous Samuelson textbook in 1961 had growth forecasts for the United States and the Soviet Union for, uh, that went out till 1985. And the uncertainty for the Soviet Union was a wider band than for the United States. But the American band lay entirely within the Soviet band. So it was possible that the United States would end up richer than, this, than uh, the Soviet Union, but it was also possible, easily possible that the Soviet Union would end up richer. That's why uh, one of our Harvard colleagues wrote a book in the late uh, 80s entitled uh, Japan as Number One. And so the tendency is overwhelming to extrapolation. So to suppose that China has demonstrated that it can always keep growing, the Chinese have demonstrated remarkable capacity to manage things, therefore they surely will, is surely to commit a huge historic error. That is not to say that there's a basis for knowing that they will. Oops, sorry. That there's a basis. The for, crisis. That there's a basis for knowing that uh, they will collapse, or is, we got a liquidity crisis here. Um, <laughs> that uh, uh, for knowing uh, that they will collapse, or knowing that they will slow down, but I think that they face a variety of challenges. And you know, Howard Cox, who's here, spends a lot of time studying China, and he will have more educated views than mine. But they, they face uh, rising incipient political instability. They face growing frustration over corruption, both in the national level and, very importantly, in state and local, in the regional and local governments' interactions with regional and local businesses. They, if China grows at its continue, at it, on its current growth model, it will represent the addition of 16 Koreas to the world economy by 2030. The world economy cannot absorb 16 Koreas worth of exports. Whether it can absorb two is very much in doubt, and it's showing some unwillingness to uh, accept the Korea it already has. Uh, let alone 16 uh, new ones. Chinese um, investment has skyrocketed as a share of GDP, and Chinese consumption has gone from being half of GDP in 1990 to being a third of GDP right now. That is lower than any country in peace. It's, there are no peacetime examples of either that rapid a decline in consumption relative to income, or of that low a level of consumption relative to GDP. Now, 
it may be that they will find a way to maneuver their way out. And, you know, any problem that can basically get solved by a bunch of poor households enjoying a higher standard of living and getting spent more. You know, there's a question as to just how fundamental such a problem is. But I think the risks of there being a period of dislocation and discontinuity sometime in the next decade for China have to be well over 50-50. So, so we heard... Um, and I could have added, by the way, and, and this is something that I think you might consider uh, devoting some subsequent session here to. Um, I think there is a general lack of appreciation of the salience of demography. And we do not have a lot of experience with societies that have far more people between the ages of 60 and 80 than between the ages of 40 and 60, and far more people between the ages of 40 and 60 than between the ages of 20 and 40. And that is where China is headed. That is where East Asia is headed. And on the evidence of the country that got there first, uh, Japan, it is not an easy place uh, to be. Yeah. Okay, so that's, um, that's uh, another worrisome uh, uh, element in the scenario. Now, I, I travel um, a lot to the developing world, and uh, I have this sort of like uh, cognitive dissonance that if you go to Europe, everybody's obsessed about the crisis, but if you go to uh, Africa or if you go to Latin America, there's the perception that we're living the good years, that uh, the, the, these are the good years, right? That uh, commodity prices are high, uh, capital is plentiful and cheap, uh, that there's plenty of growth opportunities, and, um, and so uh, there's a sense that, that you know, there's a lot of self-congratulation about that, that it's not these external factors, but the homework that has been done in terms of setting the economy straight, and that as a consequence, people are very bullish about the, about the years to come. So there's been de facto quite a bit of decoupling in the last three years in the rates of growth of the emerging markets vis-a-vis -vis the rates of growth of, um, of, um, of, of the developed world. Now, there's some slowdown in India, there's a, some slowdown in China, but, but um, um, there's a bigger slowdown even in Brazil. But in general, the perception is that uh, the ship is going uh, uh, in the right direction and at a fairly decent clip, and there are not that many clouds in the horizon unless something really bad happens in the rest of the world. Uh, how do you see emerging markets? Look, I think one part of this is um, water flows downhill and balls find their way to the bottom of bowls and there's some natural forces here. Imagine that you've got capital that's capital and technology that are mobile between places. And imagine that you've got workers who are kind of the same, where wages differ by a factor of 10. It sort of figures that if you, just, just like it sort of figures that if it's 90 degrees in this room and it's 60 degrees in that room and you open all the doors, that the temperatures are going to kind of equalize. If you open things up and you create a playing field where everybody can move everywhere and wages differ by a factor of 10, wages in the places where they were previously low are going to rise pretty fast. And that's a basic reality that's imparting a significant momentum to uh, the developing world. A second thing that's imparting a significant momentum to much of the developing uh, world is that if the global economy grows, there's only so much of a variety of commodities, and rising demand is likely to increase the value of uh, those uh, commodities. So I think it, sh in some ways, what should be surprising is 
that you had all those decades when you had these rich countries and you had these poor countries and they were kind of next to each other and the poor countries didn't catch up. And so if you just kind of open things up and you stand back, it sort of stands to reason that there'll be a tendency for the poor countries to catch up. And that's, I think, a fair part of what's happening. And I would be surprised if developing countries as a group did not enjoy more rapid growth than industrial countries as a group for the next several decades, barring war, pandemic, environmental catastrophe, reversion to hypernationalism, and, uh, pr uh, and protectionism. So in that sense, I think that it's natural that developing countries grow. I think there are two ideas. I think what I just said is kind of a valid idea. Most valid new ideas get taken too far. And I think there is a tendency, I think that the valid new idea I just presented, or valid new old, old new idea, it was new five or six years ago, um, I think has been taken two places that are, three places maybe, that are too far. There are people who've said that there's so much going on in the developing countries that it doesn't matter to them what happens in the industrial world. Wrong. Most, many of them have export-led strategies. And if the industrial world slows, that means lower commodity prices. That means less exports. And so they are not decoupled in the sense of being indifferent to what happens in the industrialized country. A second idea is there's so many people who live there, and their economies are already so big that they can pull the, economy, pull the global economy along, and that they can be the growth engine for the whole global economy. Well, you can't be a growth engine when you're mostly a seller, not a buyer. And they are disproportionately sellers, uh, not buyers. So I think that's a wrong idea. I think a third idea, which I actually think is, has more truth to it, but um, is less true. And this is something that uh, Professor Lawrence, who's, who's here, has studied much more extensively than I, is that somehow their success comes at our expense. And a bit, there must be something to that if the capital moves. If what happens is, is you know, when, it, when you open the doors and it's 90 degrees here and it's 60 degrees there, it gets warmer there and it gets cooler here. And so there must be something to the idea that if wages are a tenth there what they are here and then they equalize, that there's some pressures that are put here. But there are also a whole set of benefits um, because we're not just competitors as producers of developing countries. We're also consumers of what they produce. And uh, your income is the amount of money you get divided by the prices you pay. And their success means lower prices uh, that you pay, which is a good thing. So I think that, yes, there's something new. Yes, it's a different world because it's, in Tom Friedman's phrase, flat. Yes, that brings about powerful notions of convergence, but people take it too far in the three ways that I suggested. Um, the issue of jobs is a central issue uh, everywhere. I mean, it's central in the US, it's central in Europe, it's central in the Arab world, it's central in Africa, it's central everywhere. And people have been trying to look at uh, where can jobs be created. It's central to the whole Chinese story, right? That they have become the manufacturing hub of the world. And uh, their wages are probably compatible with this 30-some percent consumption rate uh, that you have in China. So if, if China were to have a 60 percent consumption rate or something, it probably won't be with this level of wages. Um, but then. A, what will have happened to their manufacturing employment. Everybody is looking for the, those manufacturing jobs. Uh, in the U.S., President uh, Obama has a plan to bring back manufacturing jobs to the U.S. Everybody's afraid of the, that all manufacturing jobs have gone to China. There are some people who, who are looking forward to the moment where wages in China go up by a lot so that uh, they'll start getting the industries that moved to China when it was cheap uh, to try to get those jobs in, in say, Laos, Cambodia, or in Bangladesh, or Pakistan. Or, um, uh, but then again, it may be that there are some synergies of uh, location of uh, 
in, in manufacturing that, that mean that you know, manufacturing jobs are just too few and not important enough to, to make a difference in the employment picture. Uh, what are your thoughts about governments trying to solve the job problem? Ricardo, each of your questions are questions one could uh, talk an hour on and scratch, uh, and scratch the surface, so I'll try to be uh, relatively concise. Um, I think the right way to think about manufacturing over the next 50 years, uh, next century, is to think about agriculture over the last century. Manufacturing is really fundamental and really special. You can't really imagine society without it. An economy that didn't do any of its own would be an economy that would have some real problems. And so people who say manufacturing matters, yes, manufacturing matters. People who say manufacturing is fundamental, yes, manufacturing is, is, is fundamental. Here are some facts that are instructive. China has done about as well as growing an economy and improving competition as any country ever in the history of the world. And there are fewer manufacturing workers in China today than there were 20 years ago. The fraction of the US workforce that is engaged in production work in manufacturing is now under 5%. Yes, there are more people in manufacturing but that counts the CEO of Ford secretary. And that counts the people who do accounting for Ford and so forth. If you ask how many people are actually working in manufacturing, it is under 5%. It is where farming was around the time of uh, the Second uh, World War. Yes, it is plausible to, to aspire to there being significant reshoring of manufacturing to the United States, basically because if the robots are going to do the production, they might as well do it close to the customers and close to the R&D labs. It is not plausible to imagine substantial reshoring of manufacturing that has any substantial labor, in, uh, labor intensity. And it is, frankly, the affectation of the highly educated to suppose that the less educated are looking for jobs on assembly lines with any great uh, enthusiasm. So I think the idea that somehow the key to our employment renaissance, we've had a 50-year trend, inexorable trend towards declining share of employment being in manufacturing. And we've had it for the same reason that it happened in agriculture, progress. Productivity has risen substantially in manufacturing. People only want so much of it. And because people only want so much of it, then when productivity increases, it takes fewer and fewer people to uh, meet the need. And if anything, the, the, uh, there's reason to think that the productivity increase, 3D, production, 3D printing presses and the like, is going to increase more rapidly um, in uh, the future. So the notion that manufacturing is a, is a viable medium or long-term job strategy for the United States is close to an absurdity. Now, just as it was rational and appropriate that a variety of things be done to preserve an agriculture sector, not to simply let the market rip and generate all the dislocations that it would. It is no doubt appropriate to engage in a set of sectoral policies with respect to manufacturing. But to suppose that manufacturing is going to be a major employment engine uh, for uh, the United States is, I think, um, very, very uh, unlikely. Are there important issues of where the jobs uh, will come from, yes. Uh, more and more of them will have to come uh, in uh, services. And it's probably, unfortunately, the case that there's going to be some tendency uh, 
for the sectors in which productivity growth is relatively slow to become larger relative to the economy than the sectors in which the productivity growth is relatively fast. Look, a metaphor for this that um, terrific Yale economist Bill Nordhaus wrote about is illumination, lighting. Lighting has been subject for about a century to its own version of Moore's law. It gets really, you make incredible progress. You can like, you can light the night. I mean, it's really not that, if you really wanted to make it, if you really wanted to play baseball on this street out here tonight, it really wouldn't be that expensive to put enough lights in to do it, and far cheaper than it would have been 30 or 40 years ago. It's just not that many people actually want to light that much past a certain point, and so, the illumination sector hasn't really been a driving sector for economic growth. The productivity <laughs> growth has just kind of made it a smaller and smaller sector of the economy. And in that sense, it's a great thing that happened, but it's not a major continuing engine past a certain point. It appears so far that the information technology sector isn't like that, and so far, there's been growing demand as it's gotten cheaper for things that involve computing power. But for a variety of other things, that's probably not true. You know, it's, the price of cars has come down by about 50% relative to the price of everything else in the last 30 years. But not that many families want to have four cars. And so that's probably the way to think about uh, these things. If you want to understand how all industrial economies are going to evolve, here is, uh, and if you remember only one thing I say tonight, here's, I think, the most striking thing I have to say tonight. If you look at the price index for two goods, television sets and a room in a hospital, or you can use, instead of a room in a hospital, a tuition at a university. Not since the beginning of time, but since 1983. The, the, the way the Bureau of Labor Statistics does it, they're all normalized to be 100 in 1983. The deflator for television sets right now is six. The deflator for, tele for hospital care is 585. So in other words, the relative price of television sets and hospital care has changed by 100. That's got something to do with how many people are going to be employed in these things. It's all very nice that we're debating how we're going to shrink government. But if you think about the fact that government buys things like hospital rooms and university uh, educations and people doing quantum physics research and people cleaning Yellowstone Park, and that the private sector buys things like television sets, <laughs> I promise you, <laughs> government will be larger relative to the economy 10 years from now than it is today, no matter who is elected president of the United States. <laughs> well, very good. Why don't we open it up to a few questions before we let you go? Yes. Germany has driven itself. Germany has pursued a uh, classic mercantilist strategy, a relatively favorable exchange rate, favorable labor cost conditions, substantial credit provided uh, to businesses through very low interest, substantial surplus, run a substantial surplus, basically as a nation provide vendor finance to its customers. And while it's been providing vendor finance to its customers, not very good vendor finance as we're finding out, it has been able to sell a lot of stuff and it has therefore grown and flourished. But there are two problems with the German model. One is not everybody can be a net exporter and every net exporter comes at the expense of a net importer. So the German model has been a 
subtractor of demand from the rest of Europe and a shifter of demand towards Germany. So it's completely non-extrapolable. And it's an open question how sustainable it is, given that a lot of that German prosperity was built by lending money to Greece and selling them stuff. And the economics of that were much more attractive when you thought Greece was going to repay <laughs> than you think now when that is uh, a proposition that is uh, substantially in doubt. So I don't think there's any question that any business that wants to put it, any reasonable business that wants to put itself on sale can grow share. Whether that's sustainable, as a, whether that is a thing that helps other businesses, no, it hurts other businesses, is, that's clear. And what the sustainability of that strategy is, is open to question, particularly when it's by lending money to the people who buy your stuff. And so I think in those ways, the German success is much less compelling as a model. Now, that's not to deny that in certain areas of policy, um, transiting kids from school uh, to work, um, transiting, uh, promoting clusters in which information is shared within manufacturing industries, uh, I'm sure Cleveland could learn some things from Stuttgart. Um, so I don't mean to minimize that there's any of that. I think the other thing that I do find uh, interesting is the proclivity of um, many in American business to be quick to look to aspects of German macroeconomic policy to explain their success, but somehow completely avoid the nature of German social welfare policy, which is a 30-year compelling counterexample to almost everything in the conservative critique of the US welfare state. Um, because the German, I mean, it's astounding. I mean, the number of holidays, the number how the length of the maternity leaves. I mean, the, the whole thing would, if a, if a Democratic senator proposed 25% of Germany, uh, you know, the Weekly Standard would have apoplexy. And somehow, <laughs> when I encounter business people talking about Germany, that's just an aspect from which they avert their gaze. <laughs> John Chisholm. It's, it's wonderful to be here with a fellow member of the MIT class of 75. Your comments about uh, electric lights, uh, TVs, cars, all declining in cost uh, relative to other factors uh, seem to point up the inadequacy of GDP as a measure uh, for quality of life. Uh, my guess is that even though uh, things, uh, the economy was uh, in such better shape in 2007 than, in, than perhaps today even, even, at some point if we just allow enough time to go by, no one is going to choose to go back to where we were at, in 2007 and give up all of the uh, advances that we've enjoyed since then, even if the economy was a lot better in 2007 than it is today or at some point in the future. So what, what progress, if any, or what uh, are your thoughts on new metrics that try to capture these uh, advances in uh, technology and uh, innovations uh, to better reflect overall uh, where we are? GDP, I think, can only be uh, defended with uh, Churchill's defense of democracy. It's really pretty lousy, but better than all the alternatives. Um, obviously, it doesn't measure the quality of our marriages. It doesn't measure the cleanliness of our. It doesn't measure the cleanliness of our streams. Uh, there are all kinds of things that the GDP doesn't measure that people care about. So it's one indicator. It's an indicator of how the economic machine is working. As an indicator of the, how the economic machine is working over relatively short intervals, I think it's actually pretty good. I think it's not plausible to suppose that if the GDP goes down by 
3% between one year and the previous year, and at the same time the number of people working goes down, that something significantly bad has happened. I think if you, you know, you can do, and uh, people have done it to some extent, and I actually think it, somebody could write a major book, um, looking at the time series and the cross-section of GDP. You know, uh, if you look at the numbers, India's got a standard of living that corresponds to what America's standard of living was, GDP per capita, that corresponds to where America was in 1810. You know, how do you think about the way Indians live compared to the way Americans were in 1810? Well, you know, you could look at life expectancy. There are a lot of things you could look at that would let you study uh, those kinds of questions. And I suspect GDP is pretty imperfect as a long-term uh, indicator. But I think as a near-term uh, indicator, it's probably relatively good, and it probably understates a lot of progress. But, you know, how fundamental it is, who knows? You know, I'll give you an example. Um, how much is it worth, how much is it worth to you that you now get a boarding pass on your iPhone, which you take with you to the airport, rather than carrying a ticket, which you carry and then present at the airport for a boarding pass. Well, that's a not trivial quality improvement, probably completely unreflected in the price index. On the other hand, how much would you pay to avoid going through security? That's a <laughs> non-trivial quality degradation. Neither of them is in the index. Maybe those two shape out equally, but in lots of cases, they probably don't shape out equally. Thanks. I would like to hear your views on the future of the financial sector globally. This is an issue that I uh, didn't uh, maybe spend enough time on. The wise guy answer is um, to quote J.P. Morgan, who was asked at some point what he thought would happen uh, to interest rates. And he paused. He leaned forward, he cleared his throat, and he said that in, based on all of my experience of many years in the markets, considering carefully the current situation, it is my judgment that the price of long-term bonds will fluctuate. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think the, I think it, in a way, stands to reason that as capital gets more and more powerful in what it can do, that the amount of effort that will go into figuring out where it's going to be deployed relative to producing more capital will increase. And that's some of what's happened. That's some of why the financial sector has probably gotten bigger in all countries um, over time. That the fundamental decisions about deploying uh, finan financial capital, finance, have gotten to be more important. I think people who hate the financial sector and think that it's a bunch of parasites, and there's something to that view. Um, <laughs> To certain, with respect to certain aspects of it, should ponder the fact, which I remember being very struck by at the time, that when the countries of Central Europe look to have radical reform and look to convert to a market economy, what they most wanted was investment bankers, not academic, not academic economists, not lawyers. They wanted bankers who could figure out how to privatize things, who could figure out how to restructure things, who could figure out how to design things as companies. And so I think the view that a lot of this is parasitic does need to reckon with that kind of observation. I think you do need to reckon with the fact that people are prepared to pay much more for things in which there is a liquid market than in which there is not a liquid market. 
and you don't get liquid markets without having liquidity providers, and another name for liquidity providers is speculators. And so I think a certain amount of what is said that, you know, it's all just a brat race of people trying to win a zero-sum game and getting overpaid for doing it is rather overdone. Having said, having said that, I think that there is a unwillingness on the part of those who are comfortable with the status quo in the financial sector to think about the fact that there was the 1987 stock market crash, there was the 1990 SNL crash, there was the 1993 Mexican crash, the 1997 Asian crash, the 1998 Russia and LTCM, the internet bubble, the Enron high yield bond collapse, and now the events of the last few years. That for a generation, Every three years, there has been an event coming out of this sector whose function is supposed to be to share, spread, and mitigate risk. <laughs> there has been an event that has caused wrenching dislocation in the lives of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And it has produced such an event every three years for a generation. And probably that's not okay. And probably that doesn't have to be. And probably that makes a case for some pretty fundamental change. And so I don't think one can, by explaining that the financial sector has some important functions, entirely dismiss the kind of concerns that exist. Last question. Um, th this question, um, you could wax on for more than an hour, so just um, um, grab whatever your thoughts are. If you could um, reflect for a minute on uh, the Arab Spring and um, the Middle East and the events that are going on there and what impacts you think that uh, they're going to have on the global economy in the near term. This is a hurting group if it can't find more expertise on the Arab Spring uh, than I have. Um, I pretend to know about a fair number of things. The Arab Spring is not one of them. Um, look, I, I, would just say, I would just say these things. Um, one, apart from the sale of oil, the Arab world is a cul-de-sac in the global economy. It is not a large market not a large buyer, it is not a large seller, it is just not that important except for in the sale of oil and then there's a set of geopolitics uh, around uh, oil. Second, uh, the evidence of social science is that democ democratic societies have a lot of advantages over dictatorial societies. They're less likely to fight wars, they're more likely to be, uh, treat women well, they're more likely to be uh, good economic contributors and participants in the global system. Democratic societies have a lot of virtues over um, dictatorial societies. That is one fact of social science. The other fact of social science is that societies in transition are the most dangerous societies of all. And so that indicates why the issues posed by the Arab Spring are so difficult, that on the one hand, the democratic state is better. On the other hand, the transition process carries with it uh, a variety of dangers. And that's why uh, the choices are so agonizing. One has to be, one's heart has to be with uh, the people tweeting in the streets. And at the same time, one's head has to caution that there are many who are seeing that as an opportunity to pursue objectives that none of us should have positive regard for. And that's why it seems to me that um, one has to, you know, Henry Kissinger framed the dilemmas of American foreign policy as all running through the combining of realism and idealism. And I don't think that's true of any issue more than of the Arab Spring. Well, we've had a ton of food for thought here, uh, but now we need some food. So 
Uh, let me say that uh, I think Larry has shown that uh, very generous introduction of Dean David Elwood was not overdone. It was very merited, and we thank you for your wisdom and your breadth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.